So last time uh, we were looking at this particular slide, and I said that when you consider data analysis, consider it as one of these five categories. These are the five general things we like to do as engineers based on our data. And if you look back at this course, here I've listed some of the examples of where we've done each one of these five. And we spent I had a bit of time actually on this last step of the process optimization and improvement using design experiments. Design experiments are also though a method of finding out more about your process, so it also goes up here on your process understanding. So it's, it's one of the reasons why I spent about a month on this. If we look back, we started this topic on DOEs at 8th of March. We spent at least a month on DOEs. Because it fits into learning more about your process. It's also great for building a predictive model of your process. So really, I should have DOE included over here. And it's essential for optimizing your process. Um, I, interestingly, I just received an email here talking about a company offering services a three-day course down in New Jersey, $2,000 for three days to learn about these tools, right? So that's typical pricing in companies in the industry for learning these sorts of skills, which you cover over this course. They teach in these intensive three-day courses, it's pretty common, um, and the typical cost of these courses are about $3,000, uh, $2,000, and then you sort of pay, pay for travel and the other expenses on top of that. So, Put, just bear those sort of things in mind when you're looking at upgrading your skills in the future um, and looking out for these courses. Look at them in terms of these five headers. If you're going to learn about a new data analysis method, look at them in terms of where they fit in, in those uh, categories over there. Now what I wanted to just talk about in the first half of this class today was uh, just to wrap up the course, is to talk about some of the challenges you will be facing as engineers with some of the data. So let's take a look at where we've come. A hundred years ago, the sort of data we would deal with was a very small number of columns K. So if we had N rows and K columns in our data matrix, these columns were by, by design very small because people were measuring these variables by hand. We didn't have computerized systems to, to measure that. So what they did is they chose very carefully which variables they do measure where possible, often lab tests or someone sitting there and recording them manually. That's why we have tools like Shua Charts and EWMA plots, because they work very well for one column at a time. If we've got a few columns, we can have about five to ten Shua Charts or EWMA Charts plotted on our process. They're also great for multiple linear regression. So regression works when you've got more rows than columns. So regression, these squares, we require that n must exceed k. So for regression, that's very easy to do. We've got a few columns k, we can easily collect data over a period of time and we can meet that criteria. And another thing that regression requires is that those columns in x be independent of each other. So that's definitely satisfied because these columns are chosen to be independent of each other. There's no way a company recording this manually would record two temperatures that moved up and down together exactly the same way. Those two temperatures are not independent. Why would they do that manually? They wouldn't. So they would simply pick one of the temperatures to record, and that guarantees that criteria of independent columns in X would be automatically fulfilled, just based on the way this data was acquired. Other data sets that we deal with are um, typically small, Row, number of rows and small number of columns. These are very expensive trials, small laboratory test work. Typical if you're a PhD or master student in the lab over there. So again, these traditional tools like these squares work very well for that. Where they break down is on some of the newer data sets where you're dealing with near infrared data. So every single infrared spectrum consists of about two to three thousand data points required at those wavelengths. So if I've got one data point for every wavelength here. I've got a, a thousand columns. So I've got a very large number of columns here, and I've got one colored line for every sample. So generally, in the infrared spectrum, I've got fewer observations than I have columns. I cannot build a multiple regression model on the infrared data. Okay, so then that leads to the next case where we've got lots of data, the number of rows is large, and a moderate number of columns. So when I say small k in this case, it's relative to n. 
small k here might be 2,000, 3,000 columns, but your number of rows is tremendously large, about one data point per second is often acquired in chemical companies. So it's typical that they acquire about a gigabyte of data per minute. So these are requiring a vast quantity of data and they never actually look at it. As my former supervisor, John McGregor, calls it, he calls it the data graveyard. All we do is we collect it and we put it in and we never actually use it in any, any form. Okay, so the typical example on this very small distillation column, you'll be collecting about 50 to 100 megabytes or so for a typical size unit. The other challenge that you will start to face that's now really only picked up in the past 20 and 30 years is this idea of 3D data sets. So we will take a look at an example of batch processes in a minute, but they also come out in image data. If you're requiring a digital image with a phone or a, a, a digital camera of sorts, or an industrial vision system. These industrial vision systems now have RGB imaging and then they also have near infrared. So if you've got one layer for red, green, and blue, there's three layers measuring your X, Y dimension. So your, your usual picture, your usual two-dimensional, but then you've got this third dimension with the wavelength. So red wavelength, green, blue, and you may have several near infrared wavelengths as well. Um, we have a camera in the chem image that's 120 wavelengths. So it goes, and that's only in the near infrared spectrum, not, not, not in the color. Uh, the United States government has satellites up monitoring the Earth that is over a thousand wavelengths. Those monitor vegetation and other other frequencies of light that are very specific. Um, so we've got a vast number of wavelengths this way, and then also very high resolution in our XY dimension. So it's, it's not atypical for cameras now to have about three to four thousand pixels in any one of those left to right dimensions. So. This data set for a single image can easily exceed about 100 megabytes on, on typical, typical devices. But there's not 100 megabytes of unique information in that picture. Okay? There's a very high redundancy. This pixel over here, its neighbor is likely the same or identical or very close to it. And any pixel in the local region then is very similar. So a very high amount of redundancy in that XY direction, but there's also a high amount of redundancy in this vertical direction. If I've got two wavelengths very close together, it's no surprise that in this direction that those numbers would be numerically similar as well. So despite the fact that we've got a vast quantity of data, most of it is just all similar to each other. There's very little information on a lot of the norms. And so that's the key, the key aspect of modern data sets today. Sure, we're acquiring bigger and bigger data sets, but we're not acquiring more and more information. It's all just real, really just noise. Let's take a look at batch data sets for a minute. Um, so a batch reactor, I just jump ahead to this slide. Uh, we're comfortable with ideas of batch reactors from reactor design course and from other experiences. We charge this reactor with initial materials, so reagents one and two in this case. I then run that reactor according to a recipe. So the recipe might call for me to raise the temperature for a period of time, then I run with a certain amount of agitation for another duration of time, then I may have a ramp down to cool the reactor again. All the time I'm acquiring data of temperatures, pressures, flow rates, agitator speed, current to the agitator. Um, torque on that impeller is another variable that's often acquired. So that's X9 and X10 over there, torque and, and current. Um, I will be measuring the level in the reactor. That's primarily just to make sure I run the recipe as it's, as it's asked for. But then I'll also be measuring the coolant flows and the coolant temperatures. At the end, I discharge the reactor, and then I send that material down to downstream processing and, and or sell that to my customer in the final step. So on that final product, then I'll be measuring a variety of final quality variables, one set of variables for that batch. Similarly, when I fill my reactor initially, I can measure the properties of those raw materials. So at the beginning, I know the properties of my raw materials, how much raw material I added, who ran the reactor, a lot of discrete, unique information that's for that batch alone. 
while I run the batch, I acquire a whole lot of data. But the difference is that during the batch, that data is varying over time. So during the batch, if X12 was temperature, I'm not acquiring a single temperature. I'm acquiring temperature changes over time for that batch. Then the next batch, I'll acquire another temperature change over time. We call each one of those trajectories. So I acquire X12 is temperature. I'll acquire a temperature trajectory for batch one. I'll get another temperature trajectory for batch two, third trajectory for batch three, and so forth. And then I'll get my final quality information afterwards. So by the end of it, I've actually assembled a pretty big data set. Let's take a look at it. For that first batch would be one row in this matrix. The second batch would be the next row, and then my final batch, N, capital N, would be that N row. Z then represents all those initial conditions. So that first entry there would make, might represent the amount of raw material of raw material A going into that. The second column in the first row would be the amount of raw material of material B for the first batch and so forth. I could have an indicator variable one, two, three, or four, depending on the operator that ran the batch, and so forth. So I have all that information within one row for one batch. The second row would be the same information consistent with the second batch, and so forth. So I actually have a 2D matrix here for this initial conditions. Same for the final conditions. So every row in the Y matrix would be the final quality variables for that batch. And uh, that's usually about 7 to 10 variables um, for most batch systems. What's interesting is this 3D block over here. This is a three-dimensional cube of data because we've got that time perspective happening. So this first slice, this first horizontal slice going in and out of the page here represents the batch data for the first batch. So this first segment running back into the board, that would represent the time basis change of that first variable. That first variable was temperature. It's the time varying temperature within the first batch. The second part would be the time varying change perhaps in flow rate and pressure would be a third and so forth. Again, typically the number of variables we have here depends on the sophistication of the company, but for most parts I've seen systems that run between 15 to 20. Um, one system I've been dealing with at, at the FASCO is that's close to 100 variables that they measure over time. But many of them, again, are redundant. So here we've got this time-based direction going in and out of the page, one slice per batch, and then if I stack them all up together for all my batches, I end up with a 3D data cube. Now that there is called this is Z matrix, this is X matrix, this Y matrix. This is what we call a multi-block data set. We haven't touched at all on multi-block data sets in this course, but the reality is that every problem you will deal with will be a multi-block problem. You will never have data just from one single source. You will have raw material information, you will have operating information, and you will have final quality variables, and your job will be to bring those together and align them up to make, a, to, to make your analysis. In one sense, we have actually touched upon multi-block data analysis in this course. Least squares is a form of multi-block data analysis, where we've got an X matrix and a Y vector. But as you can see here, we're, this is already stepping it up. Here we don't have an X matrix, nor do we have a Y vector. Here we have an X cube and a Y matrix. So we've taken everything once one dimension up. Right? But, so don't, don't feel bad if we've not covered enough to help you as an engineer. This basis that we come up with these squares is a good start for all the methods that are used then to analyze this sort of data. Okay, I'm just, today's class is more just to make you aware of where, where things are going in, in your career and some additional work that you will have to do as an engineer uh, to, to solve these problems. You're going to have to seek out tools and techniques to to analyze these data yourself. So these trajectories then, if we take, took a look at them, we could visualize it in, in this particular way. Um, here, for example, is one of the variables, the tank level. And there are, I think, about 60 black lines here, so 60 trajectories of tank level, indicating either 60 batches in this data set. OK, 65 batches. So there's 65 trajectories of tank level here, indicating for me that 
this recipe really calls for the first step to go from zero tank level to some other value over a period of about 180 minutes. And then the recipe uh, remains flat line structured. I can look at the pressure, the differential pressure x1, x2, x3. These are variables that the company did not want to reveal the names to us. So we're just calling those names. That's okay. And then agitator speeds, jacket temperatures, uh, and differential temperatures are measured here. Okay. So we've got 325 time points per batch, 10 variables per batch, and 65 batches. That's a very, very small batch data set by data set. But it's, uh, this is what the purpose of showing this to you is to sh indicate how we might visualize that sort of data. I'll jump over that data set um, and then talk about this next one over here. And let's explore some of these issues we're going to be facing. One issue that you will face is the size of the data set. So when I refer to the size of the data set, I'm really not too concerned about the number of rows. Everyone goes on and on about how big. Uh, the data sets are and the number of rows, that's really not an issue. What is the issue is the number of columns. That is our column. Okay, if we've got a large number of rows, we can deal with it because we can just run four loops and go through every row. But the number of columns is always what bites us. If I've got 10 columns, I can show then that to, if I want to plot every single scatter plot pair, I've got to make that many plots. And if you notice that that number is approximately to the power of k squared. Okay. So 10 plots means I've got about around about 100 scatter plots to consider. If only 10 variables. There's about 100 combinations that I could make of the. That's already too much. And 10 variables is a very very small number of, of scatter plots. Okay. So there's no way that even for a very small data set that we can go ahead and investigate it by hand if you manually draw it all these scatter plots. You get tired in Excel of, of setting up all those all those scatter plots. So we have to deal with that in some manner. The next uh, problem we face is the lack of independence between our columns. So again here, more of our data sets we're requiring more and more columns, that K dimension. So the number of rows is N, the number of columns K. This dimension is growing every year. Every year it's becoming cheaper and cheaper to add new sensors onto our process. Every year companies come out with very innovative sensors to add on. So while this dimension N might, might also be growing, and usually that's growing due to time, so we acquire more and more data over time, the other issue is that this horizontal direction is also growing K, because we're able to acquire this data more readily. But if you think about it for a minute, take a distillation column as an example, or any other unit operation that you like, a polymer reactor, or a bioprocess reactor, or a wastewater treatment plant, any example you'd like to think of, consider the typical variables you measure on that process. Okay, so think, think about it for a minute. What are the variables you measure on that process and how many variables you have? Now, if someone comes along and offers you sensors that you can add to that process, so you can maybe add, let's say, an additional 10 sensors onto your system. And these may acquire just redundant data that you're already acquiring or something interesting that you might not have thought of before. By adding more columns onto your data set, you're not adding more information about what's going on in the system. The system is the system, it's fixed. So adding more columns onto your data set is not adding more and more unique information. Unless that sensor really is acquiring something that's not already been acquired. So very often, the fact that this direction K, this horizontal direction is growing, over the years doesn't really mean that our problems are becoming bigger and bigger. Our process is the same process we've always had. We're just acquiring more and more redundant information on it. Okay? And so what happens unfortunately is that if we find or oh, calculate X transpose X, we'll find that we're unable to calculate it. 
you look at many of the data analysis algorithms, all of them, or many of them, form edge transpose X at some point. Recall that's the variance covariance matrix. It's a phenomenally important matrix that shows up everywhere in data analysis. So the fact that our matrices X then are becoming less and less independent means we're facing a problem where X transpose X becomes more and more singular and we're not able to calculate it and eventually convert it. So what people end up doing is they go back to the 1920s and they say, well, I'm just going to pick a reduced set of columns. They manually go back to their big X matrix and they delete, delete, delete till they get a very small number of columns that they, in their mind, consider to be independent and contain unique information. So what have you done? You've put more money to, onto your process to acquire this data, but then you've gone and thrown all those columns away to go back to the 1920s, 1950s. So you've not, you've not solved the problem, you've just kind of buried your head in the sand like an ostrich and hoped it goes away. Okay, so that's not effective either. So we've got this issue with the number of columns that you can't visualize it or make understand, get some understanding from it, nor can we actually work with it numerically. So neither from a visualization point nor from a numeric point is this helping us. The other problem is that those many columns, we're getting lower and lower signal to noise ratio. Okay, so by definition, as engineers, one of our goals is to keep our processes operating stable. That means flat lines. So remember back, right at the start of this course, we, we showed what a flat line process is, and we said that would be pretty boring. You could pretty much run that process with no operators. If you could have your process running at flat lines and constant. But what is the implication of that as well? From a data analysis point of view, the implication of flat lines means that you've got no variance. Right? Because if it's a flat line, there's no variance. And if there's no variance, there's no data to analyze. Okay? So there's very little signal and just noise. And the data that you collect is not really of any information value at all. It's constant, there may be a bit of noise, there might be a bit of drift, but really there's nothing actually happening in that data. We call that happenstance data. And we've even seen that word before in the context of DOEs. Happenstance data is data that's got no cause and effect in it. We're only seeing general correlations between our variables. The opposite of happenstance data is cause and effect data. We've actually gone and made a change. Now, I've got this comment here that happenstance data can be good enough in many cases. That's true if you're very, very careful what you're doing. If you understand what you're doing with the data and recognize that it's only correlation based, you can be okay. But in general, you can make severe errors and severe judgment errors if you rely only on happenstance data. You must manipulate your process. Um, by that I mean you must change your variables and create cause and effect in order to actually build a model for you. The other um, minor, this is a minor issue, is the fact that we have errors in our data. We've got sensors going offline or drifting or changing on us. Uh, sometimes they just record the wrong values. But that's for the most part you can deal with quite easily. The other problem we deal with is missing data, and I've already introduced you to this topic through the course. Uh, some of your assignment questions have had missing values in it. But the, but the real issue is with missing data, what you've done in the course to now is very, very suboptimal. You simply deleted the rows that had missing values in them, or deleted the columns that had missing values in them, and ignored it, pretending that they're not there. Well, that's not effective either. In many of our processes, you'll find that our data is missing intentionally. So you have one sensor that's measuring data once per second, but then you've got another sensor measuring data once per minute. So if you try to line those two data sets up, there's going to be 59 points missing in the one column every so often at a regular spacing. We have to deal with that. You can't just ignore it. Okay? And again, we can deal with it effectively using some, some additional tools like latent variable methods. Then a final one uh, that I've added to the notes just this morning, I realized it wasn't there. It's, not, it's an issue in this multiple data sources. So this idea of multiple data sets, 
where we've got raw materials coming from one source, we've got spectral data, perhaps batch data, continuous data, and final quality variables. This problem shows up when you're trying to understand your process from a global level. If you're only trying to understand your raw materials, or only trying to understand your final quality from your lab, you're dealing with one data set in each of those instances. Or if you're only trying to understand the continuous operation of the process, that's again a single data matrix. All the tools you've learned so far would be great. But we're beyond that level in many instances. In many instances we have to step back and say, well, how do these raw materials play into my process? And then how does that process affect the final quality? <laughs> also, how do my raw materials affect the final quality? So what is the you know, interrelationship between these different blocks of data? That's an important problem that we, we need to understand. Not just be able to deal with single blocks of data, but the multi-block data set problem is, um, is phenomenally important. And that's, what's interesting is that these tools and techniques were developed by, by me. So in the 1980s, this is where this started to become a problem. The, the statistical literature started to become a multi-block data set in the 1980s. So we solved that issue now. Um, so we can do it. It's just the mathematics behind it is a little bit, a bit more than, um, than would be typical for an undergraduate course. Okay, so I thought then just to give um, two examples before talking about the final exam. This first example is on process understanding. So I, I said there's two areas where you will always be using um, your, your, uh, those five areas. The first is process understanding, the second is troubleshooting. So I'll give an example of each one of those, and then we'll move on to wrapping up the course. This was an example I worked with a company north of Toronto uh, several years ago. They, their need was to understand their process a bit more. In particular, they were having their market share eroded by their competitor, who was also a Toronto-based company, um, but with the US parent. So they wanted to really understand why their competitor was able to capture more and more market share over time. What was interesting is this company had regularly gone and bought their competitor's product on the open market. And that's fair, you're allowed to do that. So they would buy their competitor's product, bring it to their labs, and measure the same set of variables that they would measure on their product, they would measure on their competitor's product. What they found was they had A, B, C, D, E, F, so six variables that they measure in their lab. If they plot on this, what I will just call a component one versus a component two plot, so this is a plot that comes out of PCA model, or at least a, a, a latent variable model for the PCA model, you can visualize these six variables. Instead of plotting six scatter plot combinations, we can compress the data down to two dimensions. Okay, so latent variables have this ability to compress our data set down to a smaller space. That gets rid of this problem that I spoke of earlier. So essentially what I did is with latent variables, we've got k columns over here. And what we do with the latent variable methods is we compress that down to a much smaller number of columns. We call that A. With A much, much smaller than K. So we're able now to reduce K columns, all this redundant, noisy information, we compress down to essentially a handful of columns, three, four, or five often. And we're able to deal with this more effectively. So that's exactly what I did is compressed it down to two dimensions and we were able to see their competitor's product over here relative to their product which was pretty much all over the place. So this told them two things. Firstly, it gave them the insight as to why their competitor was gaining market share because their customers, the competitor's customers, were able to take their product and use it reliably in their process. The quality of the competitor was always in this very tight cluster. So if I was a, a customer of the, this competitor, I could take the product and use it in my process and it would work. The next day when I got a batch of material from that area, it would still work. The next day if I got a batch from there, it would still work in my process. So I got good processability from this competitor. If I had used the purple dots, which is from the company I was working with, 
One day I'll get a batch from here, then I get a batch from over there, then a batch from here, and then a batch down here. Every time I'm dealing with that product, I'm getting a very different set of outcomes. It would be like buying flour from the grocery store, and one day you bake your cake and it works. Then you go buy flour from the, from the same company, but you get very different quality products coming out of your out of your recipe at the end. Even though you follow the same steps in your process, you're being messed around by your supplier's raw materials inconsistency. That's the first thing that this plot told them. The second thing this plot told them, it told them how they could make their competitor's product. Right? Because if we go look here, there's purple dots in between this region of where their competitor's product is. So if they go back to the point in time they made that batch with that purple dot, if they look back at their, re their records, they can say, well, that's how they got the same quality as their competitor did. And so you can back estimate how to produce the same product as your competitor. So two very powerful uh, pieces of information that they got from that very quick analysis. The second example I'd like to talk about is troubleshooting. So this is an example that uh, John McGregor and one of his grad students worked on in the month of the 1980s, or early 90s. This is a company in the United States that was finding a problem where they had this monomer produced on their process. They measured 447 variables. So their number of columns K is 447 Y. 447 variables, and these are things like flow rates and temperatures and pressures in these distillation columns. So it's a sequence of distillation columns whose purpose is to recover the monomer to recycle. So they, they feed the monomer over here at 20% level. They aim to get 99.5% impurity at the end, and from that they can calculate the recovery of the monomer. So 447 rows, they had data from about 500 days. So they had one row per day. So every row in that data set represented the average operation for that day on those 447 variables. So around day 400 in the data set, their recovery of monomer starts to drop off. From the typical 92% that they can normally recover, they're down now to about 78% and everyone's freaking out. Where do they start? Well, what this company had done for those 100 days is they were plotting scatter plot combinations of those 447 variables. And in that case, we're dealing with 447 squared combinations of scatter plots. That's what they were having the engine do, was trying to figure out when this had happened. The other thing they were doing is they were plotting those 447 variables and trying to find variables where something changes around day 400 and drifts, drifts away from the normal operation. Okay? But they had given up pretty much. By about day 80 or 90, they emailed that data to John McGregor and his grad student, and she looked at it over the weekend and found the problem right away. How did she do it? Well, she built a latent variable model where she compressed those 447 variables down to two new variables. So this matrix A had two columns and N 500 rows. So you created two new variables. Let's call them T1 and T2 is the name that we're using this in, in latent variable methods. So score one, score two, or T1, T2. She created two new variables, 500 columns per variable. So every point represents one day of operation. So that first row represents day one's T1 and T2 value. The next row, day two's T1 and T2 value, and so forth. So if I plot T1 versus T2, there's T1 on the horizontal, T2 on the vertical, I can see circles where I'm operating in day 1 through 400. The plus signs represented operations on day 401 onwards. And what was very clear was how the process drifts and departs away from that period of time. So that indicates that these two new variables capture what's going on in the process. Okay, so we already knew this though. We already knew that from day 400 onwards we had a problem. But what latent variable methods allow you to do is to ask the model, or what we say is interrogate the model, investigate the model, ask the model, well, what is the difference between the process 
here versus there. Okay, and when we do that, we get what's called contribution plot. The contribution plot tells me what is the change between those two clusters. Which of the 447 original variables are most responsible for that deviation? And what the model shows then is though these four variables stand out the most, then the three one would here, 207 and 277. So variable 207 was related to the temperature on tray 129 in distillation column 3. Variable 158 is a tag from that same distillation column. And variable 33 and 277 are related to the concentration of the formula A. And what this suggests then, 207 and 158 are by far the strongest contributors, indicate that there was something wrong with the temperature control on that particular tray of the column. And when John Thomas did come back on Monday with this information, they had actually coincidentally discovered the problem that same day. They had gone back in their archives and they found that the temperature controller on that tray in that distillation column had been turned off, had been turned into manual instead of automatic. Somewhere around day 400, someone had gone and made that change. The change didn't show up right away as a, as a drop in yield. So it took a few days before that cascaded through the system. But by then, people had forgotten that the change in the temperature control was responsible for the drop in yield, or recovery, I should say. So very quickly here, in a, in, a, in a few hours of work, the grad student was able to find these major contributors to the problem. Okay, and that's what latent variable methods are good at doing. They're good at compressing large data sets from a large number of columns down to a few number of columns. And the way they do that is the objective function to calculate these few columns is so that you retain the most information from the original matrix and ignore the noise. So the key issue is that now that I've got a few columns, now I can go back to the 1920s and use my crude tools of linear regression and time series plots and monitoring charts. Right? I have all these good things we've learned about in the course that apply to few variables we can go back and use now because these few variables I calculate, T1, T2, and maybe I'll calculate T3, T4, these four or five variables that I calculate now capture and summarize these many other variables effectively. Okay, so that's about all I'm going to say on latent variable methods in this course. Um, it's just to give you a sense of what there are about. And I strongly encourage you to, to look into these as something that you want to do as self-directed learning in your career. Maybe not right away, but certainly in a year or two's time. It will definitely give you an edge over any of your other com uh, competitors, your colleagues, I should say, um, that you're working with. Right? So it's not a topic that's taught at the undergraduate level in any university in North America. It is an essential skill. So PLS to PCA, these are two types of models you will see over and over. PCA, principal components analysis, PLS, partial least squares. So there's that least squares in there, indicating that all that PLS is, is just a sophisticated form of least squares. So strongly, strongly recommend that you, you investigate those two types of models. PLS, to my mind, is what least squares was 50, 60 years ago where everyone uses it and everyone talks about it and everyone assumes that everyone else knows what the least squares model is, that's where PLS is going to be in about five to 10 years in the countries. Okay, so it is something you have to come to terms with and, and come up with in time. Okay, any questions on that?